And we're pleased to be joined by the newly re-elected Liberal Member of Parliament for Cape Breton Council. Uh, he is, of course, Mike Kellaway. Mike, it's been busy, of course, since the election period wrapped up, but thank you for giving me some time today until Ill 24-7. Oh, likewise. It's great to be with you, Adam. Well, it's good to have you here. And let's start with the most obvious question. Was there a point during the campaign or on election night when you had a feeling that you and your team could secure the victory in Cape Breton Council? Well, I, I can say that going into the election, uh, I, I felt uh, over the last 23 months uh, that we were able to uh, produce uh, in terms of outcomes a fair amount and a short period of time, you know, working very closely on uh, the fishery benefits, working very closely on community revitalization funds, uh, working with constituents in terms of their needs and being very responsive to make sure people get a call back and also we to work on our files diligently. So I felt good going into the campaign. And I have to say, Adam, I think I had um, one of the best campaign teams in Canada. Um, I had uh, solid people working the campaign, volunteers, people of all political stripes, people of all, all, all ages, and, and really representative of the riding from people from Canso to Arishat to Pomcat to Inverness and, and, and CBRM and, and, and in the First Nations communities and the Acadian communities. So I felt really strong and good going into the campaign. And then during the campaign, uh, I, I, I felt uh, just as strong, taking nothing for granted. We had two great competitors in Jana Reddick and Fiona McLeod. And this gives me a chance to say thank you to them and their families and their supporters for putting forward a very good campaign, a very clean campaign. Uh, one that was based predominantly on issues uh, and challenges and opportunities. And that's what it's all about. It's about, you know, um, you know, when you put your name on the ballot, uh, it's you, your family, your friends are on that too, right? So uh, just a huge shout out to those, uh, to, to those folks and also to uh, the PPC candidate, uh, Mr. Mr. Grandy as well. So I, I would say I, we felt um, we had a good team. We worked it like we did during the two years of our mandate to ensure that we engage people, that we listen, uh, and that we had a strong, I think, party platform as well. Uh, one that I felt, uh, especially when it comes to a couple of areas, uh, healthcare and our commitment, and that's something I'm going to be focused on in this new mandate. Uh, around 7,500 new health professionals across Canada, uh, funding for uh, uh, increases in pay for personal care workers and training 50,000 more uh, personal care workers. And then of course, to our seniors, 65 to 74 in terms of guaranteed income supplement. Uh, our focus on the environment has been strong and the platform was equally as strong. So I wanna double down on that. And then we have are I think a centerpiece of the campaign and it's such a kind of multiplier in terms of what it can do for the country and for individuals and families is the $10 a day daycare working with the province of Nova Scotia uh, to make that a reality and uh, because that has an impact on childhood education of course it does we know that but it also has the the opportunity the real opportunity a real pathway to enable people to afford to go back to work uh, people that are looking after their children who can't afford to send their children to daycare uh, and that really opens up a lot of opportunities in terms of, um, you know, closing the, uh, the, the skills shortage we have, the labor market shortage that we have, uh, and it does play a role, a role, in breaking the cycles of poverty. So I felt we had a good campaign, we had a good platform, and uh, we had immense, immense number of volunteers. Uh, so, but I got to tell you, during a campaign, it's a, it's a marathon, and this one was... Uh, and, you know, you always have your moments of self-doubt and, you know, are we doing, how are we doing? Uh, but I never wavered on our supporters. I never wavered on our volunteers and my campaign team. Now, I'm curious, Mike, obviously there are two standouts for you in terms of what made this campaign different from the last one. First of all, you were running then for your first electoral campaign, uh, trying to replace Roger Kusner as the Liberal MP for Cape Breton Canso. But of course, last campaign in 2019, we weren't in a pandemic. And can you describe a little bit then to me what this campaign was like personally for you in terms of how it differed from 2019? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think, um, I mean, the obvious answer would be uh, COVID, but I'll break it down in other ways. I think, um, 
one of the big differences, and it's great that you make the comparison between 2019 and now, is that there was uh, across the country, uh, and I felt it to some degree at the door um, that um, people were in generally um, minority, mind you, of people that I knocked uh, doors on, were, um, were uh, 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 angry. Angry on to topics such as vaccines, uh, potential of international passports, and things of that nature. So I felt there was a bit, a uh, little elevation in terms of anger um, in respect to those two topics, vaccines. And what I tried to do, Adam, is, is um, you know, to unpack that at the door. And so I would want to try to get to the source of where the anger was coming from, uh, which meant that I was at that door particularly longer than others. Um, but it was important to kind of for me to get a sense of where that was coming from. In some cases, uh, you, you could ascertain it. But in many cases, it was a general kind of um, anger that you had not necessarily a pinpoint or pressure point in terms of what was causing it. Uh, so I would say there was a bit of that. And I think you saw that nationally too, Adam. I think, um, look, when you have any, like the prime minister, there was a poster of him in a noose. Um, I would condemn that if it was Aaron O'Toole or Jagmeet Singh or Ms. Paul or Mr. Blanchett. Uh, or Mr. Bernier. And, um, you know, we got to tone that stuff down. You, you can disagree with policy and you can disagree with politicians. That's a democracy, but you can't really, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not the Canadian way to throw asphalt at people. It's just not. And so we need to, as not just politicians, but more importantly, our communities we need to call that out and say, Hey, uh, it's a hot time during a campaign. Uh, and the time of debate is during the campaign and after the campaign, go after ideas, challenge people, challenge each other's beliefs or our, our values, whatever the case may be. But let's not get to the point where we're like the United States. And I think that uh, I'm not suggesting we are, but I'm suggesting I saw an elevation of it that I didn't like. Your former colleague in the Atlantic Caucus for the Liberal Party, Bernadette Jordan, uh, running in South Shore St. Margaret's, had targeted campaigns against her, including signs that quite simply said, vote her out, as if mm -hmm. there was anybody else that could possibly apply to. And she went down to defeat on Monday night to, to the Conservative candidate, Rick Perkins. And there was some discussion that the issue of the moderate livelihood fishery for Mi'kmaq fishers played a key role in her defeat. Can you talk a little bit about that and also talk a bit about what happens with the Liberal Party going forward in dealing with this issue now that Bernadette Jordan, the Minister of Fisheries, is no longer part of the Atlantic Caucus? Yeah, and, and, it, and it certainly is um, a disappointment. I've gotten to know Bernadette Jordan as a person, and that is an amazingly tough file, amazingly tough file, perhaps one of the toughest in cabinet, especially now. And so uh, my heart goes out to her uh, because I know the work she put into it. And look, there, there's no, um, there's very little debate on the fact that um, the moderate livelihood item played a role in her election, in her riding, uh, from a from a non-Indigenous fisher perspective, from an Indigenous perspective, or those that support one, one you know, Indigenous or non-Indigenous fishers. So I think that played a, a, um, a role in, uh, in the result on Monday night. There's no question about that, in my opinion. And, you know, what we will do as a caucus, an Atlantic caucus, is sit down as an Atlantic caucus and, and have a discussion on what worked well in Atlantic Canada and what didn't, and what do we need to do more of and what we need to do less of. So there will be those postmortems soon to have those discussions. But the, um, you know, you look at the map of uh, Atlantic Canada in terms of MPs elected, you know, um, we had, I think, eight now uh, conservatives uh, elected and the rest, I believe, are, are, are liberal. So that's a pretty good showing still. And but we need to look at what we can do and do better, and that and that will come. And and in terms of moderate livelihood, um, this is one that um, discussions and uh, discourse continues in terms of finding uh, the right balance and perspective from nation to nation, and involving industry in that discussion as well. And um, a new minister of fisheries will be selected, a new parliamentary secretary will be selected. 
um, and uh, perhaps with fresh eyes and fresh perspectives, um, you know, all of us can get uh, to a table or a series of tables to look at how do we um, make sure that we adhere to the, the Marshall decision, while at the same time ensuring uh, sustainability of the fishery and conservation for everyone. That's where um, everyone has agreement. Okay, so let's start there. You know, government, non-Indigenous fishers, and Indigenous fishers and Indigenous leadership that conservation and sustainability are key. So those are two foundational items that we agree with. Let's build from there. And this is not gonna be easy, Adam. It's not going to be easy, but look, uh, I am exceptionally honored to work with people like Carla Sampson, who's demonstrated an immense amount of leadership um, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Richmond County. And likewise with uh, um, uh, the chief of Polytech, Wilbur Marshall. So this is an opportunity for us to kind of um, perhaps recalibrate on where we are and where we need to go. Uh, I wish I had a, um, you know, a solution to give you and everyone, and then we would all agree in the next 20 minutes. But this, this we, it's taken us a long time to get here, and we want to make sure we get the best possible outcome for everyone. And that's what government's committed to. This government's committed to that. And I no doubt in talking to Carla that her folks are, and, and Chief Wilbur, but we're not gonna get there today, but I'm, I'm optimistic we'll get to a better place in due course. And, and, and again, we, we know what we saw last year was a lot of coverage on what didn't work well, but what, what did work well, it was the leadership of Carla and her team and Wilbur and his community to keep tensions and, you know, down to the point where uh, we didn't see what happened down in, um, in Southwest Nova. And we need to get, we need to understand that that didn't accomplish anything. That accomplished a lot of anger and more anger. So we're going to have to keep our perspective clear. We're going to have to keep our goals and objectives clear. And we're going to have to keep having the conversation and having those uh, those important uh, moments of discourse to keep moving forward. And as an MP, I've been committed to that. Um, certainly behind the scenes, the minister was, but now we will have uh, an opportunity to have um, a, a new minister, new staff, to take a look at what, are the, what the art of the possible is and ensuring that uh, we adhere to the Marshall decisions, uh, but also uh, listen to industry uh, and listen to what can work and what should work. Mike, I wanted to shift over to uh, something that came up over the course of the candidates debate that took place that Talil was a partner with in Port Hawkesbury on mm -hmm. September the 10th. You were challenged on the idea of holding an election right now during a growing fourth wave of the pandemic, including here in the Maritimes. Mm -hmm. Your response was that Parliament had become unworkable and you pointed in particular to opposition members of Parliament as to why it had become unworkable. Uh, even though there are still some counts going on in a handful of ridings as we see Elections Canada take care of the mail-in ballots, it looks like when the dust settles on this, the party standings will be almost identical mm -hmm. to what we saw before the election. I imagine you've heard this more than once over the last few days. So the question to you then is, do you still feel it was worth it to have had this election to try to resolve the issues that you brought up during the debate? And do you feel that we can go forward from this and that Parliament can work again? Yeah, I absolutely believe uh, that it was the right thing to do to call an election. Uh, based on where the uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet and other folks uh, want to take the country, uh, pandemic and post-pandemic, and, um, and how we want to tackle that as a country. So that's number one. Uh, number two, um, yeah, last, elect last uh, term, uh, especially in the months of May and June, got very, very, um, in my opinion, obstructionist. Um, not by the NDP or the, or the bloc, but, but the Conservatives. So the fact is, is that um, we have an opportunity to continue to do good work, to look at the art of the possible in a minority government, and the government will do um, what it has to do to make that happen. Now, it'll be up to the opposition as well to um, put a little bit of water in their wine 
because we'll have to in certain situations as well. So Canadians were clear uh, on election night uh, in terms of um, the mandate they gave us. It was a minority government and we're blessed, I'm blessed to be a part of that. But it's also um, a message uh, from Canadians to say, uh, continue uh, working across party lines and make it work and don't look for five or 10 or 30 or 100 ways not to do something. Find the way to get things done. Find the way to get things done on healthcare in terms of working with the provinces. Find ways to get pharmacare a reality in the provinces. We're working on that now. Uh, we know we've got an agreement in principle or an MOU with PEI. I believe the Tim Houston government uh, will be one that is absolutely focused on healthcare. So we look forward to working with him and, and his cabinet. Uh, look at ways to ensure that guaranteed income supplement happens sooner than later uh, for seniors. And also the environment. Um, you know, we need to say loud and clear, there is no debate on climate change. It's here and we need to deal with it. And um, those are the type of items that we'll be working on. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I've had experience in the two years of working very closely with, uh, you know, members of the NDP, for example, Don Davies and Randall Garrison and reaching across party lines. And, you know, uh, I think there's lots of room to play with the NDP in terms of some shared um, objectives. And I think, I hope that um, the same could be said for the conservatives as well. Um, but we're going to have to come together and we're going to have, and, and I think the, the message was loud and clear, no elections anytime soon. Okay. That's yes. exactly what Canadians said. And they were clear on that. And so now it is up to government and to the opposition parties to find some shared objectives, shared outcomes and get to work. That's what I heard, get to work. And um, I'm here today at work. And I apologize for not shaving today. My wife is going to cringe when she sees this video, um, but I had to get here early and I lost my razor, believe it or not. Um, but I'm back at work. And so we need to uh, get government back to work quickly because there's much to do. The last budget that was passed was significant in terms of investments. And what we wanna do based on our platform is exceptionally important. You know, a specific transfer of monies for mental health is necessary. It is necessary for Cape Breton Council. It is necessary for the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, we need to reduce wait times in mental health. We need more mental health practitioners. We need to see more money go to grassroots mental health organizations. Uh, so that that I'm going to be focused on. But the, you know, focusing on working with the provinces, and this is all when it comes to health, it's it's hand to hand in terms of working with the provinces because they administer it and they're the leads on it, but we fund it, is that we need uh, in our province to focus on that 7,500 across the country, doctors, nurses, health practitioners, social workers, to provide the funds necessary for the provinces to um, you know, reduce wait times, encourage um, people to come to rural, doctors to come and nurse practitioners and so forth to come to rural, uh, Canada, uh, Cape Breton Council would be the example in our case. And we need to, uh, we really need to support general practitioners in terms of when they're setting up their practices and provide substantial help in, in reducing uh, their student loans. But we also need a commitment from those doctors and nurse practitioners and social workers that they stay longer than three years. And so we'll be working on all of that. And it'll be a work with working with the provinces and the communities, communities like Kingston Memorial uh, in Lordways and uh, Port Hawkesbury and, uh, and, uh, and in Canso. And, you know, we already have those relationships with Dr. Kathy and Canso and the folks at Kingston Memorial. And I'm looking forward to continuing that journey and trying to make good things happen along with a new provincial government, municipalities and community groups. I am wondering, Mike, as well, too, you mentioned the NDP uh, just a moment ago and specific MPs within the NDP. The leader of the party, Yugbeet Singh, had said in the spring that he was willing to continue working with the Liberal Party to ensure there wouldn't be any elections during a pandemic and that various priorities that the two parties share could be met. Now that the election is over and the NDP seems to be of the same caucus size that could help a liberal minority last for a little while, is there any value or appeal to you or to your fellow caucus members to try to forge a stronger relationship 
with the NDP caucus, uh, whether it's a full-blown coalition government, whether it's the idea of having Mr. Singh or any of his MPs serving in a liberal cabinet. Uh, what are your thoughts on that possibility? Well, I mean, I can't say in terms of coalitions, that's um, it's not something I thought of. And uh, But I'll tell you this, I think that there's immense value to uh, further the relationship on you know areas of common interest. Um, again, pharmacare, uh, healthcare. Um, you know, as an MP, I, I on the liberal side and the government side, I've been vocal that we need to have a nationwide discussion with business and not for profits and experts and average everyday Canadians on the concept of a, a basic income. And that's something that I uh, will not stop talking about, but I also want an inclusive conversation on pros and cons and things of that nature. I mean, we are uh, home to Moses Cody, uh, Jimmy Tompkins, JB McLaughlin, um, and uh, people that were innovators uh, and uh, formed cooperatives that are um, the benchmark for the world right now. We can again be the same um, for today in terms of having conversations around how do we tackle um, in you know inequities in the system in terms of inequality and uh, financial or otherwise. So I think there's common ground there to have discussion. I think there's common ground on policy, um, and I think as MPs, this is where you know um, you know it's 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 probably the Cape Breton and Northeast of Nova Scotia way. I mean, last uh, mandate, I mean, the first day in the house before we uh, started, I walked across uh, the aisle and talked to conservatives. I talked to NDP. Uh, I actually talked to some block folks and um, just basically breaking bread. And that's what we need to do more of, in my opinion. And I think that's what Canadians said on Monday is you know continue to find areas where we can work together and let's get some stuff done and that's been my hallmark that's been my motto and and, and my inherent value of getting things done let's let's get things done we're in a political system that's obvious uh, but not everything should be politicized and by that i mean inequities child poverty uh economic development there's areas of common ground and I think our, our leadership, our prime minister will find those common common areas uh, with Mr. Singh or others to 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 have Canadians backs as we did during the um, as we did during the pandemic. And that has to continue because we're not out of the pandemic. And we need to um, have a plan on, you know, right now being in the pandemic and after the pandemic. And uh, I think that um, I, I'm. And I'm an informed optimist. I'm not. Uh, I'm not an optimist where I look at everything and go, you know, it'll get better tomorrow. I'm an informed optimist, and I kind of base it on people's actions and approaches. I think that um, I'm still an informed optimist, and I think that we have an opportunity to do some great things for Canadians, uh, whether it's healthcare or seniors or economic development or helping to break the cycles of poverty. You know, I was on um, last night. I. I um, went online and, and YouTubed um, uh, Alan J. McCacken and his track record. And um, I, there was a documentary of the things that um, a minority government under Lester Pearson did uh, in terms of Medicare and uh, EI. That was during a minority government. Mm -hmm. And it was people like Alan J. Um, that worked across party lines. And I'm sure that wasn't easy. And I'm sure it wasn't everyone singing Kumbaya and getting things done. There had to be moments of debate. And um, but what what his hallmark was as a politician, there were many. But one of his hallmarks was listening. Listening. And I think that we would all um, do well in politics to have more Alan J's in terms of listening and making efforts to work across party lines. I certainly have in my 23 months as MP, and I look forward to doing that more um, and uh, to get things done. Because, you know, why are we here? We're here to serve our constituents. How best do we do that? Well, in a minority government, that is working on the art of the possible and working with people on the other side of the aisle. 
So I'm looking forward to meeting my, you know, conservative friends and NDP friends and my green friend at the moment. I, I don't know the second person that was elected, but we'll get to know each other. And, and hopefully that will be um, in due course uh, in person, but for now it will be Zoom. Well, last question to you, Mike. Uh, you did bring up the Prime Minister a moment or two ago, and I do want to speak to you about Mr. Trudeau. For whatever criticisms have been leveled at him in terms of the timing of this election uh, and the earliness of this election uh, coming less than two years into his latest mandate, he does join a select group of nine Prime Ministers that have won three federal elections, whether they be majority or minority. Mm -hmm. Obviously, his story is not yet finished. Uh, he goes into this new mandate as the prime minister with the most seats, obviously. He still has mm -hmm. some difficult waters to chart in front of him. But what's your thought about serving in a second government under Mr. Trudeau as prime minister and liberal leader and about his overall legacy and whether at all that's been tarnished by the calling of this election at this point? Yeah, um, I guess I'll start with... Um his legacy, I think that's still to be written, but I will say that, um, and I've said this a lot in this campaign, and uh, it really comes from my dad. And, you know, dad would, was in charge of mine rescue. So he would train men to go down in the mine to save people. And it was a pretty rigorous process, but he often said that crisis reveals character. And I think that if we look at uh, the time, uh, the past 23 months, I think it's revealed the prime minister's character. And I think that will be a part of his legacy for sure. But I think there's much more. And there's another chapter here. And I'm excited to serve under him and serve with him to, to you know, write that next chapter. And leadership is not easy. I'm sure if you asked uh, Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Singh, they would say leadership is not easy. You try your best to help as many people as possible. You have to make difficult decisions uh, that you wish you didn't have to make. Um, I don't think I know anybody, anybody who's gotten into politics to, to, to not help people. And sometimes you can't. Uh, I think with the prime minister in the past 23 months, we did everything we could to keep an economy going, to keep people working, to help people replace their income that they would have, that they definitely lost overnight, gig economy workers, uh, self-employed people, freelancers, um, you know, and then providing wage subsidies and things of this nature. And it was still people, a lot of people are still hurting. So we need to continue to work on that. And um, I got to see, um, quite frankly, a tremendous amount of empathy from the prime minister during our caucus meetings, uh, but, a, but an immense amount of focus. And that's what I want. When, when the chips are down and we have to jump in a foxhole, I, I want somebody steady at the wheel who will say and act um, to help Canadians. So uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to serve with the prime minister, quite frankly, and, uh, and I appreciate um, his, his efforts. And so, you know, and I think that if you look at Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Singh, you know, they also, uh, you know, had their challenges during this campaign as well. And they also had their you know, successes too. Um, but everybody that attempts to serve or serves does it in my opinion, because I, I like to think I'm not that, that cynical. They do it because they care and they wanna help. And, you know, and I think that what we need to kind of get back to in Canada is have strong debate on the issues have strong debate on policy, have just strong debate on, you know, each other's work ethics. I think that's fair, you know, like, you know, that I think that's okay. What we need to tone down, and we need to have a national discussion on this because I think it's really important, is, um, you know, the anger of, you know, putting SWAT stickers on people's faces. This is not, that wasn't a one-off. Uh, female MPs uh, being... Um, accosted verbally by people. We need to unpack that. We need to have a conversation on that. I think it's really important to do so uh, because that does cross the line. It's not who we are, but I'm seeing more of it. And I believe that 
that's where local media and Adam, this is where I think tell ill local media matters. And that's why we need to invest more in local media, quite frankly, because far too many people on the left, in the middle, on the right, are getting their information from Facebook and other social media platforms that have no that have no um, journalistic integrity. And we need to figure this out. And I don't know how you do. I, I wish I had the answer for it. But I see when when local media is strong, and we invest in social and uh, local media, they are fair and balanced and tough on everyone. But at least it's based on facts, not innuendo. It's based on not gaslighting. It's based on truth and accuracy. And we kind of got to get the pendulum has gone way too far the other way. And I'm not sure how we get that back, but we do need to have a local, regional and national, and dare I say, international discussion on it because people are influenced by um, Facebook. And, you know, I had an opportunity to chat with many people and, uh, and some a minority, you know, get a lot of their news from certain Facebook air, um, you know, sites that are designed to just reinforce a bias on, on, on all different political spectrums. And uh, we got to get out of the silos. We got to get out of the silos. It's 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 best for a democracy. Well, we at Tell Little Community Television have never operated in a silo and we never nope. will. So uh, we appreciate your cooperation with us. And we've appreciated your cooperation with us, Mike Kellaway, over the past 23 months in your first run as a member of parliament. And we look forward to being able to continue that in the months and years to come. But thank you for giving me some time here in what is a busy election aftermath. I know uh, we appreciate you joining us on Tell Ill 24 seven today. Anytime, Adam, and thanks again for your work in Talil. It's been important, and uh, I, I really appreciate it because we need strong media locally, and uh, you do a great job, and everyone there in Talil does as well. So, all my best. We appreciate that, and we'll do what we can to keep that going. Thank you very much. Mike Kellaway is the newly re elected Member of Parliament for Cape Breton Canso for the Liberal Party of Canada, and we've been speaking to him via Zoom today.